Deputy Director of Events here, um, where we now host in-person events with virtual events, partnered and supported events, and then we also have trips and classes. Um, you can find everything that we have booked on our website at politics-pros.com. Um, and then before we get started, I want to ask everybody, please silence your cell phones. Um, and we, then we get to the Q&A. Um, there's a mic right here to your right, um, kind of hiding behind the pillar. So you just come up and speak into the, the microphone. Um, and we are recording it and live streaming on our YouTube channel. Um, once the event concludes, um, We'll have a signing right up here, so you'll, you'll just line up right here and have your book signed. Um, and so now, without further ado, um, we are here to celebrate Bettina Judd for her new book, Feelin', Creative Practice, Pleasure, and Black Feminist Thought. Feeling is not feeling. As the poet, artist, and scholar Bettina Judd argues, feeling in African-American vernacular English is now black women artists approach and, uh, and produce knowledge as a sensation, internal and complex, entangled with pleasure, pain, anger, and joy, and manifesting artistic production itself as a meaning of the work. Through interviews, close readings, and archival research, Judd draws on the fields of effect studies and black studies to analyze the creative process and contri uh, contributions of black women from poets to visual artists. Bettina Judd is an interdisciplinary artist, performer, and writer whose creative research centers black feminist thought. Her poems and essays have appeared in Feminist Studies, Torch, Mythian, Meridians, and other journals and anthologies. Her collection of poems titled Patient, which tackles the history of medical experimentation on and display of black women, won the Black Lawrence Press Hudson Book Prize. She is the associate professor in the Department of Gender, Women, and Sexu Sexuality Studies at the University of Washington. I'm very excited to welcome her here to Politics and Prose because I got to see her read a, a few times in Seattle for um, for patient while while I was living there. So without further ado, please welcome to Politics and Prose, Bettina Judd. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, yes, coming all the way from uh, Seattle <laughs> um, and seeing each other in DC, which is a former hometown of mine. I'm used to live in Northeast. So I'm Bettina Judd. I'll read a little bit from the introduction um, of the book, um, as well as kind of contextualize a bit of the first chapter, which is on grief. In the delirium of a felt life is the made thing and having made a thing worth feeling for. I lose myself in the frenzied rapture called life can attest to having felt and in that heightened state of life create. The evidence of creation means I came out on the other side of rapture and yet I am still in it. We now, that is me, you, reader, viewer, listener, are still in it, even as I may have moved on to the next thing. And if I know anything, I know how to bend time this way. The pen, the flickering cursor, my small bit of power the universe has given. Living with our just time, global pandemics, war, genocide, extinctions and destruction of habitable lands and clean water, one could ask if artistic creation matters at all, if creative practice is frivolous, ornamental, or in poor taste in respect to our current conditions. To a question like this, I offer the poet's response in Intozaki Shange's The Lizard series. Quote, that's why poetry is enough, Issa. 
It brings us to our knees, and when we look up from puddles of sweat, the world's still right there, and the children still have bruises, tiny white satin caskets, and their mothers weep like Mary shoulda. There's nothing more sacred than a glimpse of the power of the universe. It brought James Brown to his knees, Lil' Anthony too, even Jackie Wilson, arrogant petty motherfucker he was, dropped no knee pads in the face of the might we have to contend with. And sometimes young black boys bleed to death face down on, face down on asphalt because falling to our knees is a public admission to a great big old scarlet letter that we can't, don't want to escape any feeling, any sensation of being alive can come right down on us and yes my tears and sweat may decorate the ground like a veve in Haiti or a sand drawing in Melbourne but in this swooning in the delirium of a felt life lies a poem to be proud of does it matter can you stand up child end quote this into Zaki Shange. well how does it feel to live amid global disaster. What do you know of it? Disaster is here, has been here, will be here even as we are told up along with it. To run from feeling is to attempt to run from disaster itself. And exactly where are you going anyway? As the late Nina Simone said in a moment of grief for the very recent loss of Dr. Martin Luther King, quote, you folks, you better stop and think and feel again. For it is not the feeling that is frivolous, but the avoidance of that feeling that orders destruction makes it unremarkable, ordinary. And truly, even if you don't feel, feeling is likely to catch up with you, no knee pads in the face. So this project is interested in how black women artists take up our glimpse of the power of the universe. How creativity makes its way through feeling and what we can know with the work left behind. It is interested for the same reason some of the artist's words and work direct us toward the creative process as one of self-revelation, exploration, and need. Toni Morrison has described her own impulse toward writing in terms of that need, a longing to read something not yet written. She said, writing to me is in an advanced and slow form of reading. If you find a book you really want to read but it hasn't been written yet, you must write it." End quote. Renee Stout describes her creative process. And you know, Renee Stout is a local DC le artistic legend. She describes her creative process as the very purpose of her art as well. Quote, while I can make a piece and think it's nice, I want to be on to the next piece because I get everything from the process. The piece that I create is sort of the evidence of the process but it is also for the viewer to enjoy whatever it is that I was doing in my studio. But I want to be on to the actual act of creating the work." End quote. The work, that which is less be left behind, is the evidence that something has happened here. We may enjoy the evidence of that experience and status at the gallery, the recording. And if we're lucky, we might peek into a e to catch a glimpse of the universe versus power in motion through the ways that they might have been recorded. <coughs> so um, as the book goes along, I specifically focus on one particular affective experience. Um, first grief, then joy, then ecstasy, then shame, and then anger. And um, this first chapter, the one where we look at grief, we are also looking at the structure of black studies, which I suggest is a study of grief. Um, and it is a chapter that 
In terms of the way that it engages with creative practice, it appears in the book as a series of poems. Um, these series of poems are a personal study of grief um, that are enacted through 17 plus one 14 line poems. Um, they emerge in the late, like I started writing them in the late um, summer of 2018. Um, you might have remember the story. It was it was big local news in Seattle, but it did make international news. The story of a grieving orca whale by the name of Tahlequah, or J35, who had given birth to a baby calf, and that baby calf soon died, and she carried that baby calf for 17 days on her back. Um, of course. Um, Scientists at the Friday Harbor Labs that monitors this pod um, were worried about her because she wasn't eating. You know, she wasn't, uh, and, and the, the pod is already in kind of in, in danger as the, their food source is uh, being affected greatly by the acts of humans. Um, and so they followed her, you know, by satellite and by drones and, and all of that sort of thing. Um, and so anytime the dead baby would fall down, she would dive down to go pick, pick, pick it up, um, still with her pod searching for food until um, the 17th day. And so this poem, in my own personal grief, um, sees her, but then also sees the context in which the world received her. The local newspaper had folks pouring out poems in, in dedication to Tahlequah and her lost baby. Um, and this is at a, the same time that a growing international movement for black lives is happening. And there are also many mourning black mothers. Um, so. Um, thinking in interspecies community and kind of looking at the limits of my own uh, community in terms of the, the species that is called Homo sapiens um, for our ability to you know, have this kind of empathy with a black fish but not a black mother. Um, and so there is a whole body of literature that helps me understand how that happens. Um, but that also um, questions the limits of empathy because we know the possible reasons for Tahlequah's loss. We as humans are the reason for Tahlequah's loss. Um, Chinook salmon, which are the primary food source for southern resident orcas. Um, they are uh, nearly, they're you know, at depletion uh, because of the kind of man-made actions in the waterways of, of this region, of the Duwamish people. And so, <coughs> you know, there is a systemic, much, much like with human problems, there's a systemic problem that we can, you know, empathize with. But what change can come about? Anyway, Black Studies helps me think through that, right? Um, just as Black Studies helps us think through, you know, the systemic problems that affect us as Black people, and in my thinking of it, in alignment with a kind of study of grief, you know, you can go no further, like the thread is there, but you can start, say, with W.E.B. Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk, the sorrow songs, the elegies to the loss of his own child, um, and the elegy, and, and kind of an elegy to a loss of self um, as he is crafting this concept of, of two-ness. So Salish Sea, um, I won't necessarily read from the poems. I'll be reading from those notes in Black Study. But this um, chapter starts off with um, a QR code that you can navigate to to view the film 
of those 17 plus one poems. Um, and after you experience that, go to the footnotes, go to the end notes that come toward the end of the book. Um, so I'll be reading from the beginning. This note titled, It is the Sound That Opens Wide Everything Else. We touch on death in black studies because we must. Because the condition of black life is so often described by our proximities to death, as in the only thing I have to do is stay black and die. In the study of black death, one must touch, mustn't they, the feeling of being in death's wake. I wonder, in the notes of this chapter, how black grief is in the structure of black studies, if not this black study. The pursuit of the question, how is grief structured within black studies, requires a distance from the matter of grief that I would, ra that I would rather relegate to the notes. This book is about feeling, after all, about lear leaning into the effective sedulity of black creativity and to pursue this question without attending to the experience of grief seems like an, an ironically performative byproduct of the race for theory. It is much easier to talk about than do or be in grief. In the top context of this project, it would be disingenuous of me to pursue this question without feeling, because the real question about grief and black studies, of, about black people and grief is, because the real question is uttered in a language difficult to transcribe on the page. It is ineffable, this thing called grief, an expository propositional prose sanitizes its contents. The content of this chapter is grief, as well as I could communicate it as I wade through my own experience of grief in the process of writing this book. I wade through grief with black studies to do this work and also to make sense of black terror, loss, sadness, and all the other unnamed affective experiences that grief attends to. Even that attempt to structure grief is too clinical. In my grief, Black studies, particularly black feminist studies, has been my companion, a wrenchingly honest friend, sometimes too honest, but always there. Such brutal honesty is what I hope to learn from word work, from black feminist writing that I reference and from my community of friends that take black feminism to praxis these notes are a contemplative commons, an acknowledgment of the wake work, to invoke Christina Sharp, that precedes my own. The notes stop where the meditations on grief, here titled Sailor Sea, begins in text. But the citations within these notes inform the poems on a cellular level. I thank Alexis Pauling Gums and Sadia Hartman for crafting examples of this kind of poetic citational practice. As these notes close, I imagine myself in a room full of these sighted thinkers that I feel. Imagine, if you will, yourself in the room as a voyeur, or if you feel in me, a participant. We are talking and sharing our experiences. We present evidence, pour over archival artifacts, and wonder at what we find. We pontificate, reference, and speechify. We might even laugh. There's a point at which they all must go home, away from the din of our party. And as I close the door behind them, their words, thoughts, and feelings have not left me. But in the silence of the room in which I physically, now work with me here, remain, I meet myself. And all of what could not be said before and after our meeting, full of life, breath, and sorrow, comes up through my belly, into my chest, my throat, and eyes. It fills me and overflows, becomes the room. This is what could be recorded. The note titled, It Seemed to be Embedded in the Language of Black Life. The blues is a black condition. 
The roots of the musical genre are explicitly drawn from the processes of cultural, spiritual, and bodily displacement and subjection. It would seem that a study of the aesthetics that shaped the blues and its descendant musical styles would also be be a study of grief, if not grievances, a point I discuss further. Grief and grievances are cellular to the aesthetics of black music. As Mary Baraka notes of the antecedent to the blues, fleet field hollers were, quote, sm strident laments more than anything, end quote. So cellular were these wordless, effective musical riffs to black music that for, Bala for Baraka, they could be considered lyrics. Lyrics that communicate the ineffable and the identifiable, i.e., this is my grief. Follow me here. I know that the ability to think through the aesthetics of genre does not a study of grief make, and there are way too many tributaries, and often they are less difficult to sit with than grief, but the blues would certainly be core to an aesthetic interrogation of a study of black grief. The riff marks the communicative possibilities of expressing the ineffable contours of grief's feeling. Walk with me. There is a story about Funkadelic's maggot brain that comes to mind here. For the record, George Clinton told Eddie Hazel to make grief out of his guitar. Now, how many of us are familiar with Funkadelic? Yeah, maggot brain specifically. If not, get your life, get you some maggot brain. And this is George Clinton talking. <clears throat> he says, quote, I told him to play like his mother had died, to picture that day, what he would feel, how he would make sense of his life, how he would take a measure of everything that was inside of him and let it out through his guitar. When he started playing, I knew immediately that he understood what I meant. I could see the guitar notes stretching out like a silver web. When we played the solo back, I knew that I was good, beyond good, not only a virtuoso display of musicianship, but also an unprecedented moment of emotion in pop music." End quote. The aesthetics of the riff, the circular ascending and descending repetition, the distorted and imperfect tonality of Hazel's guitar, the vocal-like melismatic divergences express grief as it is felt sonically. Hazel's song length solo was so mesmerizing that Clinton had the rest of the band dropped out of the final recording, save for a simple melancholic melody on second guitar that points to where Hazel occasionally lands. As the quote suggests, Clinton understands the song to be a signal of the band's maturity as musicians, that their ability to express a emotion matched, matched their technical proficiency, emotional dexterity, within musical proficiency is fundamental to the aesthetics of funk and blues. To be proficient in spanning affective registers through musicianship and grief made that clear. The lesson of the riff is instructive here. As studies of black folks consider the social conditions of black people, so they must consider the structures of feeling by which blackness and black studies must operate. The social experience in process to borrow from Raymond Williams, is ongoing as we feel, think, study, live, write, and teach black studies. The aesthetics of the riff tells us that there is no singular note that encompasses a singular feeling like grief or pleasure or anger and no singular series of notes either, not a solid line pointing us in one particular direction, but, quote, notes stretching out like a silver web. A study of pleasure would so encounter, nay, become a study of grief, such as the web of black studies' dexterous structure of feeling. What are we, how are we doing on time? Okay, like how many, like five minutes? Okay, so this gives me a sense of how much more of these notes to read. 
So this is the note um, grifting. In the future, if freedom is to happen, we would have to steal ourselves. We will have stolen ourselves. Or, as Alexis Pauline Gums writes into a future looking at the past, our present, quote, so they stole themselves, which was a break with everything, which was the most illegal act since the law that made them property, and they had to re-rhythm everything, retune bass in their chest, and immediately and perpetually they gave themselves away, the selves they had to give, the reclaimed flesh and bones and skin, end quote. In a past for which we are the future, we stole ourselves which is to say that we are grifting a future in the past present circumstances of living under capitalism and being moved as property, or in other words, being property. Such an imagination of past, present, future tense stealing and having been stolen points directly to memory's tether to our had to have been present. The current conditions, possibility that is echoed in a past impossible or in a past lost but remembered, the confluence of time space would be under, could be understood as black modes of being out of time, CP time. What I'm saying is as simple as someone spoke of stealing away after being stolen in a certain future tense, and here we are again. Some would call this state of having to steal ourselves repeatedly fugitivity. Fugitivity would come to define blackness in the study of the, thereof. Fugitivity, fugitivity itself would come to be a knowledge producing standpoint. For example, having stolen herself out of slavery, Harriet Jacobs makes a way for her children's freedom to be purchased by refusing to return to her enslaver. Though close in proximity to her children, Jacobs remains a fugitive, a stolen self confined in a nine by seven by three foot crawl space, enclosed and yet exposed to the elements. A one inch hole allowed Jacobs to view the outside world, her children, and the goings on of her former enslaver. The loophole of retreat is the position from which she can view the outside world. It is also the site, S-I-T-E, and site, S-I-G-H-T, through which she is both confined and free. While not freedom outright, the loophole of retreat was a spa place of her own making. In order for her children to be free, she would have to have stolen herself away. And she would not have been both nearby and far away if just in the flints her enslavers minds to successfully orchestrate the scheme. Jacob's bent reality in the crawl space, writing from a different time and place to these enslavers to avert their attention away from her actual location. She had to be more vivid in their imaginations than she was in the flesh. Yet she knew that her flesh was already ablaze in their minds, her blackness. Jacobs had been animated as a wanton Jezebel, a draptomania inflicted girl, and a careless mother. In the garret of her grandmother's home, she was altogether in that confined space, as well as Boston, New York, and no place at all. If you're familiar, she wrote letters from these locations, but from the um, slave cabin of her grandmother that was still on the plantation, right? Um, <clears throat> she was present for her children and absent from her children. Such capacities to be not in one place but in many possible times and spaces allowed for her to be a nowhere, in a nowhere all her own her own. The garret was not freedom, not yet. It was strategic confinement. I'm repeating this because it's important to remember that the conditions of enslavement made a debilitating seven year stay in a nine by seven by three foot crawl space. I had to have been space toward her freedom. 
In the end, Jacobs had no desire to play the game of slavery with her own life. She did not think herself property to be bought or sold. To steal herself was the only way to be free. And um, finally, I'll read um, from this note titled, This Grief, This Black Grief is an Accumulation of Feeling. How do you grieve that which is ongoing? Or, as Hartman queries, how might we understand mourning when the event has yet to end, when the injuries not only perdure, but are inflicted anew? Can one mourn what has yet ceased happening, injuries afflicted anew? For instance, in the fear of police brought violence in the course of grieving in the summer of 2016 when doctors told my mother, uncle, and me that my grandmother was absolutely dying and there was no other course of action to stop the process, I went into hysterics, crying and begging my grandmother to stay with us at her bed. Nurses called security as my uncle shook me into a calmer state, telling me that security would drag me out of the hospital. Sexist and racist medicine has so sanitized the course and culture of death and dying to make such an outburst of grief from a black woman intolerable, if illegible. By making death the domain of the white and male-dominated medical field, the family is estranged from the process of dying. My outburst is dangerous chaos, not a rational course of the grieving process that accompanies the death of someone who is loved. As Sharon Holland notes, quote, the family is constructed as unstable relative to the neutral and universalizing gaze of attending physicians. The hospital, unequipped for my unruly knowledge of death and dying by the, um, of death. Oops. The hospital, unequipped for the ruinly knowledge of death and dying by the family, is, however, equipped through its carceral allegiances for the emotional outbursts of black people through via security systems and police force, violence, and confinement. Like black deaths caused by state violence, there can be no black witness. Or rather, black witness is disregarded as untrustworthy. If, as Holland writes, death quote, death as, as an unspeakable subject in the hospital world is, ward is divested of its own language and is consumed by the scientific knowledge in the phys physician's possession, end quote. Black grief is the language by, by which black's death is acknowledged. Even its tone and pitch is wildly outside of the aspects of bedside care that can be served in the medical field or Western knowledge to think that my own life or the life of my family members might have been in danger because of my expression of grief is personally overwhelming. But it also signifies on griefs accumulated and confluent. My black grief grieved by the con confines of ungrievability. There is no common sense for black grief that holds the space for grieving, even as black death is so common sense to be expected and to be, in fact, so juridically sound as sharp notes that the nation's functioning depends on the reproduction of black death. Um, Yes, I will round it out with this final note. Um, remember, they gone. Holloway ends passed on with such an illustration of the ways grief, of the ways of grief to arrest, to flow forcefully through the cracks, unexpected or unexamined. On her way to view the site of Richard Wright's remains with her daughter, Ayana, she begins to recount her childhood practice of collecting chestnuts to make necklaces. And then, quote, we were relaxed and at ease until we got to the site where those who had been cremated were interred. There, 
I stopped silent, stilled but for the tears that clouded my sight. I thought of my child, our son, her brother, and I could go no further. And so we left together, her hand in mine, turned toward home, end quote. Grief is the perfume of our stifled air. Even in the most joyous of our days, we may be caught by its waft, blown, by, blown in by the weather and our weathering. My knees might buckle from its sudden strength and bring me to the earth beneath, senses taken by gravity's pull, and all that is left is this sound. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much uh, for that you. incredible reading. Um, I have a question sort of about your approach to this to this book. You blend form, sort of this academic research with uh, poetry, and then you include the QR form. So you seem to uh, play around a lot with style and form in a like very effective way. How did you approach that process? Uh, what was your sort of uh, writing uh, process? Yeah. Um, one thing I can say is that I kind of learned a lot about my process in the process of making this book specifically. Like I learned about what kind of focusing, hyper-focusing like uh, rituals I could do and that sort of thing. So one thing is like I make a very short list of various across media things I have to do in the framework of whether I'm reading them or writing them. Um, and I worked through that list. Um, the other thing was that creative process was really important to the writing of each chapter. So for instance, um, even if the results of that didn't show up like in a big way, and I'm saying this because I, I see my, my vocal teacher, Mrs. Atemi, in the, in the, in the background, but in the audience, but like um, when I, you know, I, I kind of tried to stay close to the practice of music, um, you know, for my life and for my own joy. But then also there's this chapter that I'm talking about black women's vocal practice, right? And so um, while I was also, you know, caught up in the work of people who write about music, whether they're, you know, music writers in the, in the entertainment industry or um, academics, um, I also wanted to remind myself that I'm writing this chapter because of a close relationship to my own practice um, as a person who sings and a, a person who loves to listen pe to people sing, right? So um, whether or not that actually translated into something in the page, that was deeply, that was in the background of my project. Um, another example of how that, that works is this, um, <clears throat> the chapter on Lucille Clifton. And I was like on my umpteenth uh, revision of this chapter and I needed to stop and make something that was in my head visual. And so that's actually this art piece that's detailed on the cover of the book. Um, it's pastel and gouache and, and collage. And it was, I titled it, Following the Bright Back of the Woman after a line from one of Lucille Clifton's poems um, called the, the Story This Far, um, or in the Tree of Life series. and. Um, that helped me, like picking up that line, kind of being in, in the creative process of imagining and, and imaging what the bright back of Eve would be leaving the Garden of Eden helped me understand what I was trying to say in this particular chapter, in this particular revision <laughs> of this chapter um, about Lucille Clifton's revisioning or midrash 
of the fall of man, right? So it was both kind of integral to the creative process in a kind of cognitive way, and then also in a kind of relational way to the material. And whether or not that ended up getting shared was actually largely due to like technicalities, <laughs> like can I actually like put my voice lessons or whatever I practiced, you know, in the, the book, not as easily like I could have, but not as easily as I could some of these creative processes that I engaged with, if that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Um, so I just wanted to know, um, well, first, thank you for your work. It's thank amazing. You. Thank you. We Michael. all appreciate it. Um, but my question is, um, how did it feel to write this book? Like, was it a catharsis? Did you find some wisdom? I mean, I definitely learned a lot, you know, in the process of writing the book. Um, I also, like, like, learned a lot in terms of the content itself and learned a lot about, say, my relationship to the academic writing world um, and my how I see myself in it but like I wrote this over the course of a lot of years we're talking more than a decade and um, like I wrote it at the same time that I actually I started writing it around the same time that I wrote my first book which was published in 2014 so and there's some evidence of how they're in, they're they're co-created in in the pages of of feeling. Um, so I learned different things at different iterations. I did not expect the chapter on grief to happen at all. It was not in the plan. But then things in my life changed, and. It became particular because of the overwhelming presentation and feeling of grief that emerged through the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I couldn't, and uh, I, I couldn't excuse not dealing with grief in the book, and then the kind of content of like how deep how deep it was that I could not remove grief or like not not think of grief as how it was affecting my own life and then how I kept seeing it in the work of black studies like I kept seeing how grief was and that is all of the ways um, there there is a discussion of loss deep kind of uh, like unrelenting loss, um, the pathways through which people talk about our social proximity to death, like all, like all of these things like, oh, grief is very core to this, to this work. And so um, I couldn't unsee grief as an important thing that happened. And that was not expected at all. Like in, like I looked back at my book proposal <laughs> to Northwestern and there is no such chapter, right? I had no, you know, no sense that that was gonna be a part of the book. So that was just, that was something that I learned in about in the process. I had not thought of grief at all as something that I needed to think about in such a way. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? Well, Bettina, I just want to say I'm so thrilled that we were able to get you out here from Thank Seattle. You. And I absolutely, absolutely loved hearing you read from Patient. And so now hearing your voice from like these types of essays is, is just absolutely beautiful. And I love, it's like a, a multimedia mix of a book that is just beautiful and Thank you. I, I really appreciate it I, I appreciate your writing um what you're writing about um and it's just fantastic so um I, if we could all just give Bettina a round of applause thank you thank you so much for coming out
Thank you. And books are available back at the registers, um, and Bettina is going to be signing right up here at this table. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. I'll be right back. Okay.